is found there in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. And, uh, you know, it's a very famous verse. It's used a lot, and, I, and there's probably uh, a, a lot of sermons on it. But the, the, what I want to focus on is I want to take a true biblical approach to this verse in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. You know, I remember a couple years back before I go into the message itself uh, that the, uh, the lesbian mayor, Anise Parker, was inaugurated into, um, into the city of Houston. Now, I wasn't here, but I, I knew a pastor was there, and he, was, he talked about how it bothered him that the person that was in, that was, they had, a, I guess, a minister of the faith, because I don't call him a preacher or a pastor because they didn't preach the Word of God, and they were talking about how they were using this verse to bless this thing, which, of course, we know that that's not possible, and that they had said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and then they skip that part of turn from their wicked ways, and then they, they just read the rest of that verse. And so the verse there is in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so it's a popular verse. And the title of my message before, I, that way I don't get distracted, is if my people. And that's the part that I want to focus on. You know, this is a very popular verse and it's used in a lot of scripture. I mean, in a lot of sermons and in a lot of motivational speeches from people that are spiritual. But the reality is, I mean, if you break this verse down, and actually if you break this whole chapter down, even the chapter before, and just the whole building of the temple, and in the blessing of it, you know, God's talking to His people. It's not talking specifically to everybody in general. This is not a verse that we can just use to bless everybody. This is not a verse that we can apply to the entire world. This is a verse that we apply to us that are saved by grace. He says, if, if my people, and you know, I printed it up before I go into the points of the message, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to break down this verse, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this verse specifically, and how it applies to our life today. But you know, the word if is a conditional word. So it's not, these things are going to happen. It's not a commandment. It's not something that's going to, it's not a set in stone. These things are going to happen if certain attributes or if certain terms are met. You know, the word if, if you go to dictionary.com, uh, it, it's used, it says, in case that, granting or supposing that, on condition that, even though, uh, you know, I'm not going to read them all, but, it, it, you know, another way that it could be used is, uh, synonyms for it are provided by or providing, implying a condition on which something depends. So there's a condition for the healing. There's a condition for the forgiveness. There's a condition for God even hearing us. You know, I like to use the uh, Webster's Dictionary 1828. Uh, you know, I just like the, the, the original definition of it, uh, you know, and, and just making sure that it all lines up with the, the consistency of the definitions of words. And it's the same thing, you know, it's just... It is used as the sign of a condition or introduces, introduces a conditional sentence. It is a verb without a specified nominative. In like manner, we use grant, admit, suppose, regularly, if should be followed as it was formerly by the substitute or pronoun that referring to the succeeding sentence or proposition. In other words, you know, and whether or not it, it, it's conditioned on certain terms. And so God, you know, we... I've heard people use this and they love to stand up and I, I remember even hearing some of these more event like charismatic preachers and they're like, if my people which are called by, you know, and they, they get really into it and they love just focusing on this verse and how the land will be healed and how if we vote a certain president into office or a certain senator or if we do a certain thing or if we take a certain position, God's going to hear and he's going to forgive and he's going to heal the land. But I mean, really, let's take a look at what the Bible is really saying, I mean, let's first go back to verse 13. It says, uh, you know, Solomon, uh, verse 12, actually. And it says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. So God listened to the prayer of Solomon. You know, and then he, he tells Solomon, he says, If my people, which are called, so he's given them the condition, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. And then he reminds them, it's not just my people, but those that are called by my name. 
shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And then verse 15 says, Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made into this place. Then, so he's saying after these conditions, then will his eyes be open, then will the Lord be attent to the prayers. So what, the first thing that it's telling me, or the first thing that we can take out before I even get to the points is that God doesn't listen to everybody's prayers. You know, just because you, you say in a prayer does not mean that God is listening to the prayer. You know, so let's go, let's break this down. So first, the first things first, who are his people? And it says, if my people, who are his people? Well, let's go to Genesis 41, and then we're going to be in Exodus. Let's go to Genesis 41. Does the Bible give us, uh, you know, is, is every time the word my people used in the Bible referring to God's people? No, it's specific to those that are saved. And I can, and I, the reason I'm pointing this out is I want to prove that it's not just specific to everyone. And, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, this is one of those verses, but, you know, they use a lot, it, the world does, and even these these false spiritual leaders, where they take verses out of context and they want to apply it to everybody. You know, and I'm not talking about dispensationalism like, you know, these false religions do. I'm talking about how there are certain things that you have to read in context in the Bible. You know, the Bible specific, sometimes it is talking, talking to the saved, sometimes it's talking to the lost, and sometimes it's referring to everybody. You know, the Bible says in John 3, 6, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. It didn't say if my people or, you know, these certain people or this belief system, you know, so I, I'm making that, that distinction because it's very important. If you go to uh, Genesis 41, verse 37, he says, and the thing was good. We're going to go verse 37 through 42. He says, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. So Pharaoh has a people and he says, look, Joseph, you're going to be over my people, not God's people. Pharaoh is actually referring to the Egyptians and those that are, you know, the Jews, the, the Israelites and, and the people and, you know, the world travelers that are living there in Egypt. And he's saying to Joseph, these are my people. In other words, they have the belief system that the Egyptians have. They have the, the customs and the lifestyle of the Egyptians of that time. And Joseph is put in charge of them. But then if we go, and the reason I chose this is because if you just go a few verses later, you know, after Joseph dies, then comes in a new Pharaoh who's not so kind to them. And then that's when Moses comes on the scene. And if you go over to Exodus uh, 3, uh, chapter Chapter 3, verse 6, verse 6 through 8, uh, he says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of the taskmaster, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land of, and a large, and unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and unto a place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Parasites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so we see that now God's talking to Moses, and he's saying, my people. And what he's talking to, what he's referring to is those are his people that he had chosen at the time, but also these are people that have, uh, that believe on faith. And, you know, we can go, and I'm not, this is not a sermon on faith, this is not a sermon on, you know, I really, I mean, honestly, you could break what I'm going to talk about, and each one of the topics could be its own sermon, and I had to be very careful, uh, as a matter of fact, this might be one of my longer sermons, I had to be very careful to try to condense it, but one of the things we see is that his people are those that are living by faith, that have put their faith on Jesus Christ. Now you say, well, you're talking in the Old Testament. Well, yeah, we know that salvation was, Christ is in, in, from the beginning all the way to the end. It's just that, you know, in the Old Testament, they didn't know the name of Jesus. 
they just knew that Jesus, the Messiah, was coming. You know, we, we later get the, it's the foreshadowing, right? But if you go to Acts 7, verse 30, we'll just clear that up for you so that there's no confusion. You know, um, and the reason I, I guess I'm talking like that a little bit is we just got done soul winning. And it, I just think it's funny how people will tw twist scripture or take a couple of verses out of context without reading the whole thing. So, uh, you know, I guess I'm a little bit more aware of making sure that we clear all this thing, these things up. But if you go to Acts 7, uh, verse 30, Acts 7, verse 30, and then we're going to be in, uh, if you'll go to 2 Corinthians after that, but Acts 7, verse 30, all the way down to verse 35, Acts 7, verse 30, he says, And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight as he drew near to behold it. The voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, and I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge, the, God, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in a bush. And so we see that these are his people, and we know Acts, you know, this is where you have the day of Pentecost, this is where you have a lot of the, the churches and, the, and, the, and, the, and Christianity just growing by leaps and bounds shortly after the death of Jesus Christ. This is where we see Paul's, uh, Saul to Paul's conversion. This is where we see Stephen Stone. And all of this, and, and they take time to remind us of the Old Testament when Moses is said, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. You're going to lead them out of that captivity. And that verse right there, verse 34 says, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and come down to deliver them. So who are his people? Those that are saved by Christ. Those that are believers, those have put their faith and trust on Jesus Christ. You know, go uh, to 2 Corinthians 6, and I'll read for you first, I mean, uh, John 1, 12 and 1 John 3, 1. And John 1, 12 is a verse that I use a lot in soul winning. And it's, uh, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, we could just say, his people. In 1 John 3, 1, while you're turning there to 2 Corinthians 6, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall be see him as he is. So we go back to 2 Chronicles 7.14. It starts out with, if my people. You know, so you're there in 2 Corinthians 6.14. And what, what God is saying is we should be separate because Christ has separated us once we've believed. You know, we've become part of his family. We are no longer, as Hebrews would say, we are no longer bastards, but we are, you know, the sons of God. We are children of God. Right? And in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be ye not equally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Uh, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. And you know, it's funny. I mean, it's not funny. I, I put this in on purpose. I, you know, sometimes we use just regular terms, but it's interesting that, we, that I'm using this because what was, if my people was when they were, uh, when he, uh, Solomon had finished praying after the temple was built, right? It says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? But here's the, the thing. When Jesus came, it says, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord 
the Lord Almighty. And so the first thing we need to understand is we are His people. Those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ are His people. So this conditional statement, this conditional verse starts out to us. You know, it's, and so we have to be very careful when the Bible, when we use the Bible, who are we talking to? We have to do it in the context of what, what we're talking about. Because, you know, I mean, honestly, I've probably heard more on this verse than, than, than I could probably discuss here in an hour. And then, what are, what's the next phrase? It says, which are called by my name. So, if my people, which are called by my name, and, and there's biblical scripture, or there's scripture in the Bible, to back this point up. And I just want to make, we're probably going to spend a little, just a little time on here, because the next verse is, the next part of that verse is what we're going to really focus on. But it says, which are called by my name. So, if you'll go to Matthew 7, and then we're going to be in Matthew 10, I'll read for you Daniel 9. And in Daniel 9, 17, it says, now therefore... O oh, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant. So see, he's making a supplication to, to have his prayer heard. So another thing, just going back to the beginning of our sermon, is that God doesn't hear every prayer. We have to be his people, and there has to be certain conditions, right? It says, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication, and cause thy face to shine upon, upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake, O oh my God, incline thine ear, and hear, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, hearken, and do, defer not for thine own sake, O oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name and so we see that it's not just his people but they're the ones that are called by his name i mean i know it's redundant but god does that you know in the bible sometimes he defines his terms in, in the same verse so that we allow the bible to define the bible you know we don't go outside to outside resources or commentary to do that i know it's interesting the pastor this morning was talking about uh, you know uh Balaam, and he was talking about how the, uh, the dumbass was speaking, uh, and that commentary says that, you know, God was speaking through the dumbass, and uh, Pastor Cobb made a, a point to say that, you know, the Bible says that he opened the mouth of the dumbass. You know, let's not read more than what's there. God opened the mouth of the dumbass. I don't know if he was speaking through it or not. It doesn't, doesn't give us that. So let's let the Bible define itself instead of going to some man who is going to put his thoughts and feelings and and his ideas into something, and then he can twist scripture out of context. So let's go to Matthew 7, uh, verse 21, and it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And if you go out so many plenty, you know what, we can go to other verses in John that uh, specifically give us the will of the Father. We're not going to touch on that today, but... Uh, and it's obviously just to clear that up, the, the will of the Father is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast, have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So being called by his name and being his people and you proclaiming that you're called by his name and calling him, calling yourself his people are two different things. And we know these verses have to do with salvation. So it's this specific set of verses is talking to us that are saved. And he's given us a, a series of instructions as to how he's going to heal certain things and how he's going to forgive our sins. But we have to first realize who is he addressing this to and what is he addressing? It's a conditional address. It's a conditional uh, uh, set of instructions that he's given us and then you know how do we know we are called by his name in Matthew 10 22 and ye shall be hated of all men for my my name's sake but he that endureth to the end shall be saved you know turn over to uh, James while we get ready for this point but you know what's a good way to 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 find out if we're his people what's a good barometer how do you try the spirits what it's not the only way but it's a really good way if the world hates you or someone that you know is of the faith, it's probably a good barometer that those are 
uh, people that are living by faith. Now, that's not the case all the time, so I'm not making, you know, there's exceptions to that rule. But for the most part, you're going to find that to be true. You know, and we can think of examples, uh, you know, with uh, pastors that we associate with that are hated by the world. And, you know, we, just a couple of days ago, I was uh, doing an interview for a, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Ben the Baptist, and we were talking about this trip that we did to Mexico through Faithful Word Baptist Church in Arizona, and we were talking about how that Pastor Stephen uh, Anderson, how Pastor Stephen Anderson is hated by the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC. And, you know, the Southern Poverty if you know anything about them, they hate anybody who stands up for any morals, but specifically if you stand for Christ. And so, you know, and ye shall be hated of all men for my namesake. See, in thy name, right, Call, are called by my name, but that he endureth to the end shall be saved. So we see, if my people, which are called by my name, well, what's that name for us? That name is Jesus. You know, what's the most hated term? Why is it, why is it that, you know, television and Hollywood and the world likes to use Jesus Christ as a negative thing when we use it for salvation? Why are they using his name in vain? Why are they using it as a cuss word? Why is it that they don't use, you know, Buddha or Allah or Muhammad or, uh, you know, Joseph Smith or Ellen G. White or, you know, any of these other false prophets? Why is it always the name of Jesus Christ? Because they hate him. Because the world hated him, so they're going to hate us. So we can specifically know that we are his people and we are called by his name when we proclaim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're not talking about this prophet. We're not talking about a happy Jesus. We're talking about the Jesus of the Bible. And for us specifically, the King James Bible, you know, the word of truth. So let's go on to the next point. So we see that it's if my people, which are called by my name, and then the next part says, shall humble themselves. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, that this, this was my last interaction before I came here to, tonight. And it, you know, it was a, a, a couple, a Hispanic couple that was arguing with me about how you have to work out your own salvation. They were referencing Philippians and about how, you know, it, it's true that, you, that salvation is by Jesus Christ, but that we just, you know, we have to con continuously repent and repent of our sins and blah, 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 blah. And I mean, I showed them all the verses. Eventually, we just, I know I had to dust my feet and move on. But you know, what's one of the things here? <coughs> in this verse, what you see is that this is after it's my people, which are called by my names. Then it says, shall humble themselves. That's the next one. You know, God did it in a specific order. It's not humble yourselves, then be my people that are called by my name. It's you humble yourselves. This is the works after the salvation. See, actually, the reality is that humbling is an act of, you know, you're, you're bringing yourself lower. You don't want, you know, you're bringing... You're moving the spotlight from you, and you're putting it on Christ. That's, that's the, way, the easiest way for me to describe humility, right? And the Bible actually gives us a contrast in Proverbs 29, 23. It says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. See, the pride is someone who thinks they're real high, and it usually knocks them down. But it says, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. In other words, those that aren't looking for that. And what, what, uh, what, what the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, being humble is an act, something that we have to constantly be working on, but it's when we have our focus on Jesus Christ and we're looking to do the work. If we are focused on the works first, then what ha will end up happening is what, it, like, what we see in Matthew 7, where it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father. You know, because what, what's going on is, you know, I'm looking forward to getting into heaven. I'm looking forward to eternity because of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I know the Bible doesn't say this, but if we were to be asked, why are we allowed into heaven? We say because of the blood of Jesus, because I put my faith, I put my trust on Jesus Christ. Not because, you know, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And so we see there, let's go to James Four, and then we're going to be in First Peter. But in James 4, verse 6, he says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we see that contrast, right? He says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, 
He's in opposition with the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit. So immediately after humble, he says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist or be in opposition to the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And we know James also tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How do we create stability in our lives? And this is a side point. It has not, it's not part of the sermon, but how do we create stability? We humble ourselves. We submit ourselves to God and we resist the devil. But um, go to 1 Peter 5, you know, talking about uh, being humble. And then we're going to be in John 15. Go to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5, and we're going to see that contrast again. And it says there, the elders, in verse 1, says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in examples of the flock. In other words, don't, if you're a pastor or an elder, a leader in the church, don't go around toting that, uh, that leadership, your title. He says, not being lords over God's heritage, but being an example to the flock. How do you lead? You lead by example, according to God's word. It says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye, all of you be sub, yea, I'm sorry, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that, ye may, that he may exalt you in due time. So who's going to do the exalting? God will. But we have to then be humble or we have that work if we want to after salvation. See, it's still a free will. It's still an ability for us to choose if we want to grow in, in, in our Christian walk, if we want to read more Bible, if we want to go out soul winning. I mean, there's a lot of saved people that don't go soul winning. As a matter of fact, the majority of Christians don't go soul winning. You know, the majority of Christians don't read their Bible. Most, as a matter of fact, there's even, I would venture to say that the majority of evangelical pastors have not read their Bible through and through. And, must, and if some of them have said they've read it, I would then venture to say that they haven't read it multiple times. Now, I'm not talking about those that we associate with, because we know most of them have read their Bibles multiple, on the top of multiple times, have memorized chapter upon chapter, verse upon ch verse. But, you know, that's the separation. That's the difference, is that the works came after the salvation, not before. Because, I mean, the Bible's clear that it, it's not of works. It says, if my people which are called by my name, and then shall humble themselves. Let's go to John 15. Go to John 15. And we're going to be in verse 1. John 15. <clears throat> verse 1. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. See, how are you part of the vine? You have to, you know, Jesus, if he's the vine, I mean, how are you a branch? You have to be part of the vine. And, I mean, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's just, it's so clear. I mean, this is how you know that you try the Spirit. If you read this to somebody who's saved and they don't get it, you know, it'd make me question their salvation, or maybe they just need a little bit more training. But if they don't get it after a while, we really need to work on them, because this is clear as daylight here. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purcheth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. See, when people give you this whole work salvation, this whole repent of your sins, this whole, like, I've got to take care of my own salvation, uh, work out your salvation, what they're saying is that they are the vine, not the branch. And you can't. What does it say there? It says, it uh, abide in me and I in you, except the branch cannot, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except 
it abide in the vine. In other words, a branch doesn't exist by itself. It says, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He, to, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them to and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm fighting a little bit of a something here. Verse 7, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. How do we bear much fruit? Well, the Bible tells us there in verse 2, he says, And every branch that bear fruit, he purcheth it, uh, pur purgeth it, that it may bring more fruit. In other words, what he's doing is he's purging our iniquities. We have to purge our iniquities. And it's a combination, right? We have to work with, uh, you know, we have to be, we have to humble ourselves. We have to be his people. We have to be called by his name. We have to then humble ourselves. And then the next, the next part of the verse says, and then we, we pray and seek his face. See, if we're not asking God for forgiveness, if we're not, you know, confessing our sins to Jesus Christ, if we're not constantly looking to walk the right path, then when we're out there soul winning, when we're out there trying to advance the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not going to be able to bear as much fruit because we're just in, we're our own roadblock. You know, the Bible says that he's going to purchase that we may bring more fruit. And in verse 8, he says, Herein in my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. So how do we bear much fruit? When he purges us and then we glorify the Father. And then uh, that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. So <clears throat> let's go back to uh, the points here. And if you want to turn to Matthew 6 while we're, we're doing that. And then so we see, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, so we've already established that, you know, first we're saved, then there's the work that we're going to do, show humble themselves. Because by the way, humbling yourselves, removing your ego, removing, uh, you know, the, the natural carnal instinct to want to get recognized for the work and for the numbers and for the, you know how much memorization or how much you know you know that's a hard thing but the bible says that we must submit ourselves right and then it says you humble yourselves and then the next phrase is pray and seek my face so matthew 6 25 <clears throat> go to verse 25 let's look at that pray and seek my face it says therefore i say unto you take no thought for your life you know, and I did a, a couple weeks ago, I did about, you know, wanting nothing. And the Bible says, take no thought for your life. In other words, don't, don't plan this thing, this worldly thing. Our plans should be heavenly. It says, for, uh, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. It's not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking a thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, and we're talking about the temple that Solomon built, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And here's the part of the verse that I want to really focus on. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the, the morrow, for the morrow should take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, what's interesting, I didn't really do it on purpose, but this is another one of those really famous verses, right? But seek ye first the kingdom of God 
and all these things shall be added unto you. And people will take this verse and say, oh, see, if you see God, he's going to give you wealth and he's going to give you money and he's going to give you a good job and he's going to give you a good wife and good kids and a wonderful life. And then one day you're going to retire. And you're going to spend time on the golf course and then you're going to die. But the reality is that's not what God's telling us. He says, humbling is not retiring. Humbling is not being comfortable. Humbling yourself is not having a great job and a wonderful income and all the, the things that the world, all the materialism. Humbling is not getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning on Black Friday, you know, because we just got done with Thanksgiving. Humbling is not preparing for Christmas with hundreds of dollars and hundreds of gifts for everybody. Humbling yourself is being a bay, uh, is being a, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. Uh, humbling yourself is submitting yourself to God so that He directs your path. See, because there's a way that it's right in our eyes, but it's not right in God's eyes. So we have to be ready to pray and seek His face. See, He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we pray and seek His face. The challenge is that, you know, we take all these verses and then you get these false preachers and they tell you all this and they try to sell you on health and wealth or how wonderful your life's going to be or, you know, that things are, are set a certain way, but the reality is that when we're doing all this, we're doing it for God's kingdom. We're doing it not only for the soul winning, but so that people live godly lives. You see, it's not enough to just soul win. Hey, I'm a, I believe in soul winning. I'm wholeheartedly sold out to it. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. It's not only great and wonderful, and it doesn't matter if I thought it was great and wonderful. It, honestly, it's biblical. But the Bible also gives us a lot more, you know, if we, we, all those people that we've led to the Lord when we go uh, knocking, if they're not afterwards going out there and doing the same, and they're not growing in Christ, well, guess what? The condition of this world, the wickedness in this world will remain the same. You know, we have an opportunity right now in this generation to go out there and get the gospel to every nation, get the gospel to every home. <clears throat> and, and another thing is to raise up a new generation. See, when I got saved at age 25... You know, I was taught the Romans Road, but I didn't have all the, the, the tools and the resources and the encouragement to go out there and door knock the way we're doing now. You know, so think about the next generation that's coming up behind us, my kids and maybe even their kids, who will do better and greater works for the Lord because they're going to walk into our labors. You know, so we've got to pray and seek His face. And then let's look at what, what the Bible's telling us here, right? You know, so let's go back to that verse. And, you know, I want to make sure we're, we're getting caught. It says, and turn from their wicked ways. And turn from their wicked ways. And this is where we get into this whole controversy, you know, and I'll probably do a sermon on it as far as my understanding of what it means to repent. Because there is a, a huge misunderstanding and a huge deception of what it means to repent. The Bible speaks of repentance, but not the way the world teaches it. You know, but let's go there because... <clears throat> It's to turn from our wicked ways, right? He says there, and I know it's not using the word repent, but it says, and turn from their wicked ways, which in essence we could then say the synonym is to repent. See, to repent is just to turn. You're not, you're not like stopping all your sinning. It's to turn from their wicked ways. You know, and if, if, it's a really good example, right? If, if you wanted to say to turn from their wicked ways, well, you know, I mean, a white lie is a sin, but we're all sinners, and, and sometimes in the in the in the in the uh, in the day to day, sometimes you might even lie and you're not even aware of it. But a wicked thing is something that you're pre, you know you premeditate. Like if you're going to go out and murder people and you're going to become a serial killer, that's premeditated. That's wicked. You know, even the world understands that's wicked. They probably don't even want to associate with a serial killer. But the world would try to justify a white lie. They call it a fib or a white lie or just a, you know, something little. But for us that are saved, you know, we know that we're sinners, but we're immediately going to ask God's forgiveness. We're going to pray and seek His face and His righteousness, right? And so let's go there to Genesis uh, 13, and then we're going to turn a few pages back to Genesis 6. And just, you know, so what's going to occur when we turn from our wicked ways or when we repent from our wicked ways? In Genesis 13, 12, 
God gives us certain examples of this. It says in Genesis 13, 12, it says, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and, land, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And so we see that Abraham gave the choice to Lot, and Lot didn't turn from his wickedness. In other words, he went towards it. And we see later, and I already did a whole thing on that, but Lot's, Lot was saved. But he, man, he just loved being in that, in that carnal flesh. He just loved being with the workers of iniquity. He loved being a friend of the world. He just, he didn't get into his reading like he should have. And he didn't go out to soul winning. And he didn't realize that maybe this is not a good city to be soul winning in. You know, if I said, hey, let's go, let's go soul winning on Montrose Street. And for those of you who don't live in Houston, Montrose is where all the sodomites and the queers and the pedophiles live. If we went soul winning there, you know, we wouldn't probably lead anybody to the Lord. Maybe, you know, a straggler that, you know, in between there might be one guy. And you say, well, what about the one or two people that live in that neighborhood that aren't living their life like that? What if they don't get a chance? Well, the Bible says to go where it's receptive. To go where, you know, if they, if they turn you away, then go into another city. There's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in this city that want to hear the gospel. And let me tell you, it is much more receptive at the apartment complex we were at than if I went down to Montrose. So see, we have to turn from the wickedness of the world. We have to separate ourselves and we already showed you that, you know, if we're his people and we're called by his name and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. You know, and, and, and what I mean by that is we're not looking to partake. We're abstaining from all appearance of evil. Go to Genesis 6, 5. And I like that, that, that story in Genesis 13 because it's just a good contrast of Abraham who pleaded with God. You know, if there be 50, if there be 40 if there be 30, if there be 20, if there be 10, and then immediately after in the story, if you read it, you know, God's now sending the, the angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they couldn't find even 10. And if you look at Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and the Lord said I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of this earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air for it repenteth me that I have made them but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and what we see here is that if we don't turn then God's going to take you know he's going to pour out his wrath and we know biblically that that's going to happen at some point you know, we know that God's going to pour out His wrath, that we're going to go through the tribulation, that there's this, this period of uh, wickedness like we've never seen. You know, the challenge is you've got Christianity trying to make it all, uh, you know, fluffy and, and palatable to everybody, and, and everybody has a chance, and God will save all the people, and He's love, and all this stuff. So they've got even Christians deceived that we're headed in the right direction. But if you look at the Bible and then you look at the, the, the signs out there, we're actually headed in the wrong direction and it's our responsibility to respond to God's conditional request. It says, if my people, you know, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, you know, and then I'm not going to finish it because we'll get there, right? Let's go to 2 Chronicles verses 6. 2 Chronicles, let me just finish this point. 2 Chronicles 6. And actually, if you just want to turn to James 5, and I'll just read 2 Chronicles for you. James 5, to close out this point. We're going to be in James 5. 2 Chronicles 6, verse 7 says, Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build an house for the name of the Lord, God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, For as much as it was in thine heart to build an house for my name, thou didst well in that it was in thine heart. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son, which shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house for thy name. And we know, if we were to read and do a whole sermon on this, that he had too much blood on his hands. And so see, it's not enough, and this is not the only example. You know, we know that Moses didn't go into the promised land because he struck the rock twice, and that all those people that were with him didn't go into the promised land because they were afraid. In other words, it's not enough to be his people called by his name if we want something great to happen, if we want to use this verse to motivate people, it's not enough to just be saved. You know, then he's asking us to pray and seek his face and to turn from our wicked ways. 
And then what will happen? What are the consequences of this action in this verse? In this set of verses, it says in verse, uh, I mean in James 5, go to James 5, and we know the next part of the verse, he says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So there's a list. You can make a checklist. It says, then will I hear from heaven. Not until that point. Then will I hear from heaven. Too often, we just want to get up there and have vain repetitions and pray that God will just rain down and do all kinds of great things for us. But the, but the challenge is, you know, when will God hear from heaven? And James 5.15 says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So our prayer is not just like, you know, dear Lord, thank you so much for today. It's wonderful. He wants us to be in our closets. He wants us to be sincere. And it says there, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. And this is the part. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So it's not just that we're seeking His face. It's not just that we're praying. We are praying effectually. We're praying fervently. We're doing the work. We're not just, this is not just going through the motions. The consequences that God will hear from us when we're praying fervently and effectually and when we're zealous about it and we're sincere in our prayer. And He says, then will He hear. Then will He listen to us. God will hear from heaven, right? Go to uh, 1 Peter 3, and I'll read for you uh, Revelation 8. Go to 1 Peter 3. Um, uh, yeah, go to 1 Peter 3, and I'll read for you Revelation 8. He says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And so see, the smoke of the incense, which is filled with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God. So it's His people, because who are the saints in this, in this reference? It's those that are saved by grace through Jesus Christ, those that have believed on the name of the Lord, those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. When they turn around and they pray effectually and fervently, then it says, and the smoke and the incense came up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God, uh, out of the angel's hands. And then go to 1 Peter 3.8 on this prayer part. It says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be, be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto, that ye are there unto, called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil or hate evil or abhor evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against all against them that do evil. So his ears are open. So see, there is a, there is a way to get God's attention, but it's not the way that we think. And that's the challenge with, with uh, you know, false religion and false doctrine is that they're trying to tell people that you can get God's attention for this, all these conditions, but it's really the other way around. It, the, the verse starts out, if my people, not we're going to give you the condition, Lord, if I pray, if I do these things, then uh, you know, please come to me. First he says, look, you're my people, then I need you to do these things. And there is a difference. I know it sounded like I said the same thing, but it's where the heart is. You know, people pray to God because they're, they're, they're relying on their works. Or are you praying to God because you know that he sent his son to die on the cross for you and there's nothing that you could have done to deserve this eternal gift? You know, there's nothing that you could have done to get into heaven other than accept to believe on the gift, you know, of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's going to happen? Well, then he's going to hear us. 
That's great. So now he's listening. He says, Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. So he's going to forgive us our sin and he's going to heal the land. That's the last two parts, right? He says, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, what I'm about to say, this is more of what I think is going on based on this verse and what I've read. And if there's a correction to be made, I'll make it. But I believe that if we really applied this verse to today, that, you know, the next time that God will forgive and heal the land will be when he finally, you know, after the tribulation, after the pouring out of the wrath, and he sets up the millennial reign, because we just seem to go... Now, I believe there will be pockets of revival. I think that we are in the middle of, of a, a pocket here in the U.S. with the, you know, the new IFB and all these... Uh, preachers that are preaching hard on the Word of God and that are not compromising and they're holding steadfast and unmovable. You know, I think that, but if you were to look at it in contrast to what is supposed to be the evangelical, uh, uh, the evangelical group that compromises the U.S., you know, all of Christianity, I mean, it's a small percentage. You know, I mean, there's if you look up on the, diff, I don't know, it's hard to keep up, but there's like 20 or 30 or 40 pastors out there that have churches that, that preach hard and that believe in soul winning and that believe in, in, you know, the whole counsel of God and they're King James only and they're not compromising on the hard doctrines. You know, there's maybe like 20 to 30 to 40 uh, churches out there. But then, I mean, there's thousands of independent old IFB churches. There's thousands of Southern uh, Baptist Convention. I'm just sticking with the Baptists. There's thousands of all kinds of Baptist denominations, but they're not looking to, they're not using, they're not doing this. They're not following these set of instructions. And so how is God going to forgive the entire land? How is God going to heal the entire land? I think that individually we have his blessings, but overall, why would God spare this land with all the wickedness that we allow? Day in and day out. Day in and day out. I mean, it's just, you turn on the television, and, and I mean, I don't, I don't turn on the television anymore, but I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed since the last time I turned it on, but you turn on the television, and it's wickedness. You turn it off, you turn on the radio, it's wickedness. You, you drive down the road and there's billboards, wickedness. You, you uh, go into the workplace, wickedness. You, you go into these... Uh, Evangelical churches, wickedness. You know, let's let's have all the cohabitators on this side. Let's have all the pedophiles on this side. Let's have all the, you know, homos on this side. You know, let's have all the blasphemers on this side. And then and then we'll all meet together because God is love. Nobody's standing on anything. And then they're all like, well, I don't understand why God's not forgiving us. I mean, we read the verse. We believe it. We got preached about it. But they're not doing any of the things that are necessary to get it done. Let's go there to go to 1 John. And we're going to close out in 1 John and then 2 Peter. Those are the last two set of verses. But God will forgive us, right? God will forgive us. So the consequences, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will God hear from heaven and he will forgive our sins. And he will heal the land. So let's go to 1 John uh, 1, 5 says, This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And I love these set of verses because, I mean, it's just so consistent with this. There's so much doctrine. There's just this one verse. It's so consistent with the rest of the Bible. You know, just in case anybody wants to, you know, I, I hate those people that just try to find errors in the Word of God or contradictions. They just want to take verses out of context. I mean, everything I've shown you is consistent with that one verse, right? It says, but if we walk in light as He is in light, we have no fellowship. Uh, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I mean, you know, there it is again. I mean, that's how you know that sometimes you just, I was so focused on the set of that verse and just breaking it down. 
and in there I got a lot of these popular verses that people love to use, but then they don't tell you, they don't put all the specifics in there. They're not giving you the whole story. There's just one verse taken out of context. You know, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We forget that we also, you know, must not walk in darkness, that we must not be friends with the world, that we must turn from our wicked ways, that we must do all these things. We must pray and seek his face. And then go to 2 Peter 3, 9. What's going to happen? Well, God will heal, heal the land. It says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye, uh, what, what manner of persons ought ye to be in a holy conversation and godliness, in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And, you know, that's really what, if we were, if I wanted to, well, I guess not if, that's conditional, I already did. If I, you know, if I was going to preach a sermon on Second Chronicles 7.14, which I already did, you know, sometimes we just, our nomenclature and, and nowadays is funny, but it's that that's the, that's the finality of this for me, is that we don't know how long. The Bible tells us there's signs. You know, I'm not going to predict when the end of the world is coming. I'm not going to predict when Jesus is coming. I know certain things must occur that haven't occurred for, uh, for, for us to see the sign that it's drawing nigh. But one of the things I do know is that there's going to be a downward spiral, a falling away, and we see that. But this verse that's used a lot, and I've heard a lot out of context, is specifically speaking to you and me that are saved, to you and me that have that eternal security. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. So we need to be humble. We need to be, shall humble ourselves means that I have to make a concerted effort to humble myself. Not tell others that I'm being humble. Not tell others how great and humble I am. That's not humble. But we should just humble ourselves. And then we pray. What do we say? The fervent, effectual prayer that availeth much. And we seek His face and His righteousness so that all these things can be added unto us. And turn from our wicked ways. Then will God hear from heaven. And then He will forgive our sin. And then he will heal the land. And I mean, it doesn't take a lot. God's army is not as big as people want it to be. You know, we have examples of that where it's not the size of the army, but the quality of the army. You know, we have a great group of individuals right now that are on fire for the Lord. And the thing that happens is when there's a, a fire like this, the devil's going to be on an attack mode. And so we need to be uh, aware and we need to now get God's attention so that He can forgive us our sins and He can heal the land because we can do nothing without Him. And so it's a very important uh, sermon for myself that, or for anybody that it's if my people. See, it's a conditional thing. If we do these things, then we're going to get these, these results. Not just read it and then tell everybody that it's all great. Go home, pat yourselves on the back, watch your football game and call it a day. No, I mean... This is all the hard work. Well, how do you, what's, a, what's one of the most humbling things you can do? Go soul winning for a couple of years, see, for a couple of hours and see how humbling you're going to feel after. I mean, get a couple of doors slammed in your face and see where that pride goes quickly. You know, get a couple of guys to maybe outverse you as you're learning. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you have to learn somehow. But every once in a while you run into a guy that just, he's going to bring out scripture. And if you haven't been doing this long, if you're new to soul winning, you might get stumped. Well, that's good. Write it down, study to show thyself approved, and go back out there so the next time this thing happens, you can address it. You know, pray. Pray to the Lord that He leads you in the right direction so that you can uh, uh, learn the scripture that is necessary to go out there and do the things that need to be done. And I'm not just talking about soul winning, also when you get up here and preach. You know, I mean, this country is so enamored with the politics 
that they've lost sight of what's the reality. You know, there's wickedness in both the Republicans and the Democrats. And every time that one of these individuals dies, case in point, George W. Bush, or uh, it was George W. H. Bush, or whatever, the older Bush, you know, all Christians are going to be like sobbing and mourning and everything. And like I said this morning, it doesn't matter what your stature in life was, if you were a president or if you are a janitor, all that matters is that you have Jesus Christ. All that matters is that you're His people. All that matters is that you're called by His name. But for us that really want to do above and beyond, we need to take these conditions so that we can get Him to hear us, so that we can get Him to forgive our sins, and so we can get Him to heal our land. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for today. 